Okay, so welcome to the fourth uh, segment of our Q&A. It's our last one. And uh, these are just general questions associated with mental health in general. And some of them I can answer and some of them I, I can't really, but we'll just go through and um, we'll just go through them. Uh, but what one question is, what could hospitals be doing better in the area of congenital heart disease and mental health? Well, they certainly could be providing a lot more mental health support to the children and to the families. The problem is that the staff are, um, uh, or the hospitals have got limited funding. The staff are doing everything that they can to support all the families. Uh, and they do a great job under enormous pressure. Um, so they, they, they we certainly could be providing more mental health support, but the way that the funding works at the moment, there's just no funding, no funding for further services. But again, each hospital is different. As a psychologist, I would always be arguing for more mental health support, uh, particularly within the hospital setting. Um, thoughts, what are my thoughts about desensitization? So can we be better prepare our children for surgery by visiting, visiting the hospital beforehand? and exposing them to the sights and smells when they feel safe. Um, and that these, these family says, we've done this before and found that it does help. So that certainly can be very helpful. Just being um, comfortable with the environment and with the space can make the whole experience a little bit less scary. There is research going on in that space. There's um, an amazing group of researchers in the hospital um, and linked with some other organizations on the campus that's looking at um, virtual reality. And uh, this is more in the oncology cancer space, looking at how virtual reality can, can help reduce distress when they go for, for scans, for MRI scans. So we are starting to move in that area in, in terms of uh, improving the hospital experience and reducing distress. Um, I struggle with anxiety and so does my teenager at times. Can you suggest ways we can better handle this, preferably without medication? So again, everyone's going to be different and it's going to react to different approaches. Uh, but I would speak to your, your GP and find a really good psychologist or therapist that you're comfortable speaking to. They've all got different approaches. Again, it might be cognitive behavior therapy or acceptance commitment therapy or mindfulness-based approaches. Just shop around and find a clinician that you really feel comfortable with and that it's got an approach that really works for you. Um, but I can't really answer that in, in, uh, specifically because everyone's quite different. But there's lots of different approaches on how to, um, on how to manage anxiety without medication. Is there research that looks at the incidence of substance abuse in families of critically ill children? I imagine that there would be, uh, but I don't know much about it and it's not an area of expertise of mine, so I, I wouldn't really feel comfortable commenting uh, about that. Um, if you could uh, provide general advice or suggestions to parents who've just found out that their child has uh, a heart condition, in regards to looking after their mental health and the mental health of their family, what would it be? Well, I, my advice would be to, to make time and to find time um, to engage in activities, uh, to engage in strategies to benefit your well-being and your mental health. Um, it's, um, it's, it's so easy to get caught up it's, it's such a stressful time for families and it's so easy to get caught up in all the distress that you're experiencing and also all the medical demands, all the appointments, all the information that you have to know about that, you know, it might be several months before you, you, you hit a point where you're able to take a breath, which is why we actually named the, the, our program Take a Breath. You're actually able to take a breath, take stock and, and realize the impact that it's had on your mental health. So seeing if you can make sure that you find time to actually um, uh, do some things for your, your own well-being, for the well-being of your child and your family is, is critical. And again, doing it in a way that's uh, preventative um, and doing it in a way um, where you're addressing these symptoms and these problems early on 
rather than waiting until they, they develop and get more chronic and more ingrained uh, over time and that can get more difficult to manage and to deal with. Um, aside from mindfulness, do you think things like music therapy are beneficial? How does it benefit the brain? Um, I, don't, I believe it works, but I don't exactly know why. Uh, again, this is kind of moving out of my area of expertise. Um, we've got some really great music therapists in the hospital and um, I love that particular type of therapy and there's children and families that really respond really well to, to music therapy. I don't know the research uh, into music therapy in terms of mental health benefits and in terms of, of changes to the brain. I'm sure there will be some research out there but I couldn't comment on the research. But again, I have to stress that everyone is different. If it's something that works for you and is helpful for you and your children, makes you feel better, makes them feel better, there's no reason to be stop, stopping it. And if you haven't tried it before and you would like to try it, try it because it, it might be something that's beneficial. If it's not something that you feel is is helpful or supportive, then then you can stop. But um, I always advocate, I'd advocate trying um, different types of therapies that are available in the hospital um, to see what works for you. Um, another um, uh, parent uh, shared an article um, saying that pe uh, people born with a heart defect are great at risk of mental health problems, uh, in particular the biological impacts and gaining um, uh, a greater understanding of what is actually happening within our bodies during these stressful times. Uh, and a quote from the article is that since the heart is central to our nervous system, any heart problems may affect how efficiently our bodies respond to threats. This could in part explain why people with congenital heart disease are at greater risk of anxiety, depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. This risk is further increased by exposure to potentially traumatic life events such as surgery and being separated from parents due to periods of hospitalizations. So I'd certainly agree that um, this group is at greater risk, but I would also like to stress that other groups are also at greater risk, like the children with, with cancer, um, you know, burn victims, children that have gone through traumatic experiences and, and traumatic treatments in the hospital, even treatments where they're trying to um, uh, save their lives or improve their quality of life can be traumatic in themselves. So. Um, so it's not just the, the uh, cardiac disease population, um, it's, it's quite prevalent across different populations, but it is a big issue. It is something that as parents you should be thinking about and concerned about and keeping an eye out for. Um, and, and yes, there is, there is research going on in, in this space. There's always research going on in this space in terms of how we can better support children, how we can better support families to reduce the distress and impact uh, of medical procedures, on, of specific illnesses, on their mental health and their quality of life. A um, couple more questions. Um, sometimes um, we're so focused on your child during hospitalization that you don't notice the changes in yourself. How do we stay more aware? And again, this comes back to mindfulness and again comes back to the reason why we named Take a Breath, Take a Breath is because what we have found uh, anecdotally clinicians is, is we found that um, parents were just so focused on being there for their children, on understanding as much as they could about the illness and what they could do to support them, that they didn't, they're not really focused on themselves. And what ends up happening is after you know, a, a few months when the acute period starts to settle down and the child becomes to be more stable medically, it's at that time when parents can uh, take a breath, take a few moments, take stock of, of their lives and what's happened, the, the roller coaster they've been through, and it's at that point where they, it really hits them in terms of um, uh, the, the, the distress that they've experienced and it can really have a detrimental impact on their mental health. So again, mindfulness is, is really critical. It can help you just to increase the awareness um, of what you're experiencing of the thoughts that you're having, the emotions that you're feeling, and how that's affecting your mental health. I think that's uh, really critical. 
And again, as much support that you can get from friends, from family that understand what you're going through, that support you in a way that makes you feel supported. Sometimes um, loved ones can try and help us and try and support us and they can make us feel worse. So just try and find the right people that can make you feel better and make you feel supported. Um, how important is it for loved ones um, of a person with cardiac disease to take a break from the hospital, even if it's just for a few minutes? It's hard to leave. It's so hard to leave and I always feel guilty. Such a, a common, common thing for parents to feel guilt about um, their child's illness, their response to the illness and how they're supporting their children. Um, uh, I think what's really important here is that it's, yeah, it's, t it's completely, I completely understand it's, it's very hard to leave and there's a huge amount of guilt that comes with the idea of leaving. Um, uh, but also, it's, what's also important for your child is, is your mental health, the mental health of the parents. Because parent mental health uh, good parent mental health is, is obviously beneficial for the child. So even though you do feel guilty, notice, use mindfulness again, notice that guilt, but also notice that by you doing that, you're, you're doing something for yourself to improve your mental health, which in the long run is going to be beneficial to your child. So um, it is very hard to leave and it's, it's really hard to make that decision sometimes. Uh, but um, having uh, a child at home come home where the parent is in a, a really bad state with regards to their mental health is also um, detrimental to the child can be detrimental to the child um, the subject of death is still quite taboo should we be having more conversations around uh, death should we be prepared um, how do we have these conversations in a healthy way without creating fear and anxiety now this is a great question and I think this is a really important topic particularly with this group of, of parents and families and um, again I, I could talk about this but I don't feel like I'm a real expert uh, in this space in having these particular kinds of conversations so I think this might potentially be another topic for Rachel to consider um, because I think this is such a crucial and sensitive topic that it's certainly worth having uh, an expert that specializes in this area to talk about that. But it's a great question. And uh, last question, what messages would you like the Fontan community to hear or think about regarding mental health uh, and well-being? Well, I think the, the big thing that's come out of all of our research is mental health of parents is, is so critical. It's critical for their own well-being, but also for the well-being of um, their children and the development of um, the, the, their children. Um, now that our, our, our surgeons and our doctors are getting so much better at, at, at saving the lives of these children, uh, what we're actually finding is that um, that actually is resulting in, in uh, lots more lives saved, uh, children and people living longer, which is wonderful, but now we're seeing the longer term mental health and quality of life impacts. So it's certainly something that we, we really should be considering and thinking about from an early age. Um, and, um, and, and it can affect our relationships with our partners and with our children. And the earlier that we're able to notice and identify these symptoms using mindfulness, uh, and the earlier we're able to seek treatment to be able to cope and manage these symptoms, then the greater likelihood that they'll have a less, lesser impact on our lives and our relationships in the long term. So once again, I'd really like to, to thank, uh, thank you all for, for listening. I'd also like to thank Rachel and Ingrid again for inviting me to, to talk to you all. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Wasn't able to answer all of the questions or address all the, the questions that were emailed in, um, but please feel free if you would like um, some more information, please get in touch with Rachel or myself and I'll be happy to answer them by email. Bye-bye.